This morning, we're going to be talking about the compassion of God. As we continue our series, God's Story, Our Story, we're going to fast forward from last week. We, last week, we looked at Jonah chapter 1. This morning, we're going to be looking at the end of that great story from the minor prophet by looking at Jonah chapter 4. The compassion of God, this really is, as O. Palmer Robertson said, the theme of Jonah. And where it's not explicit in the first three chapters, of Jonah, it becomes crystal clear, like any good story leading up to the grand finale or to the end, we see in Jonah chapter 4 this rich theme of the compassion of God. My good friend Dr. Sam Lamerson reminded me last week that as we sit in the Coral Ridge Sanctuary, we are in the belly of the fish since the sanctuary has been designed and built in the shape of a fish if you look up to the ceiling. Jonah is the only prophet, as we established last week, to be sent, surprisingly, to the Gentiles. Jonah is not the prophet that's sent to the people of God, but Jonah is sent out from the people of God, from the northern kingdom of Israel, out to the Gentile city of Nineveh. Nineveh was the largest city for the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians happened to be at the time of Jonah's calling the arch enemy of the Israelites. So no wonder why Jonah struggled and resisted as he did with this message and with his calling to go and preach the gospel of God to the Ninevites. Quick recap in between where we were last week and where we are this morning. Eventually in Jonah chapter 1, we see Jonah running in the opposite direction. I heard the calling of God, but no thanks God. I'm going to run in the opposite direction. He gets tossed overboard and he gets swallowed up by a great fish. Notice it doesn't say a great whale. We don't know if it was a whale or some mammoth sea creature, but we know it was a great large fish. He spends three days and three nights in the belly of this great fish. In Jonah chapter 2, he calls out and cries out in repentance to God. God relents and appoints the great fish to spit Jonah out onto the shore. In Jonah chapter 3, Jonah finally, begrudgingly, but finally goes to Nineveh, that great city, and preaches the message of repentance. And something remarkable happens. Revival breaks out. The whole city turns and repents to God. Even the king turns and repents and calls upon others in Nineveh to turn and repent. For the king of Nineveh says, maybe even this God will relent. And it comes to us a great surprise that what we expect from Jonah to be incredibly joyful and excited as what has happened to Nineveh, far from it, says that he is exceedingly angry. So what can we learn from Jonah here and about the compassion of God from Jonah chapter four, beginning in verse one through the end of the chapter. It says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He was angry and he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is it not what I said when I was in my country? This is why I made haste to go to Tarshish. For I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he, till he should see what would become of the city. And now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm, attacked the plant, and it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked 
that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, now the second time, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor and which you did not make grow, which came into being in the night and perished in the night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left, and many cattle, and the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord, no, the word of our Lord, it stands forever. Amen. This past Friday, we as a nation remembered the 19th anniversary of 9-11. And if you watched any television on Friday and Saturday, you might have seen the scenes going back 19 years ago. Those scenes of, of rescue, those scenes of compassion, where our first responders rescued and sacrificed their lives, some even to the point of death. And what did it do? Seeing those stories and hearing those stories and seeing those visions, it communicated compassion. And what did those stories and those visions of compassion do 19 years ago? It motivated an entire nation. It moved an entire country because of those scenes and those images of compassion. You would think a vision of 120,000 men and women turning to God. You would think the vision and the story of 120,000 people experiencing the compassion of God would have moved Jonah, but far from it. Jonah can't figure out the compassion of God. A city that has inflicted pain upon the whole world, a city that has inflicted pain upon the kingdom of God, how in the world can God show them compassion? What can we learn concerning the compassion of God from this story here in Jonah chapter four? The first thing is this concerning the compassion of God. The compassion of God makes us angry. If we are all honest with ourselves, we like Jonah by nature become angered by the compassion of God. Look what it says in verse one. Jonah had just finished preaching to the audience of a lifetime, his toughest crowd, the Ninevites, and they all turn. He wins them over by the grace of God. And like I said, you would think that this would be cause for celebration, that this would be cause to exalt God and to marvel at the compassion of God, but instead it makes him angry. Verse four, it says, Jonah became exceedingly displeased. The original Hebrew there makes it much harsher. The original Hebrew in verse one says, Jonah looked at it and it, he saw, considered it evil. It was evil in the sight of Jonah. Jonah looks at what God did in showing compassion to the Ninevites and Jonah considered it an evil act. Verse two, why was it evil? Verse two, Jonah says, this is why I fled in the first place because I knew you were like this, God. I knew you would do this. And he goes on listing all of these attributes. I knew you were gracious and I knew you were steadfast in love. Now don't make the mistake, these are not complimentary terms. Jonah is using these phrases in a derogatory sense. It's as if Jonah is saying, you make yourself out to be a God of justice and you do this, you're a softy God. You had your chance to be just and to bring your condemnation and your wrath down to make vengeance and make a name for yourself and you did this. What you did, God, is evil, pure evil. It made him angry because Jonah said, those people don't deserve it. I do. And you see what was happening here for Jonah? Jonah in his anger was 
his idols were being revealed and brought to the surface. How do we know that? Verse 3, Jonah makes a remarkable confession and request. God, life is over. Take my life from me. When you see a person get to this place, like Jonah, they are making the acknowledgement that there is an idol buried deep in my heart and soul, that now that it has been taken away from me, life is not worth living. What was Jonah's idol? It was security. It was his self-righteousness. God, your righteousness and your favor is for me and my people and my kingdom. It is not for those out there. It is not for the enemy. It is not for the bad people. It's for us, the good people in here. That was his idol. An idol of self-righteousness. The idol of security. What would happen to the nation and the kingdom of Israel if you start showing your pleasure not just towards us, but towards the, out, the outsiders, to the Gentiles? What would happen and the idol of security and the idol of Jonah's self-righteousness that your mercy and compassion, God, is just reserved for me and my people. It was being revealed. And Jonah says, it makes me so angry that I don't even want to live anymore. And I love God's question to him in verse 4. He says, do you do well to be angry? What is that? It's a weird phrase there. Do you do well to be angry? God is basically saying to Jonah, is this really your response? Is this really a proper response? 120,000 people turn and receive God and you're mad? And you want your life taken from you? He's saying, Jonah, is this really how somebody responds? Is this a proper response? And I want to ask you this morning, do you do well? Do you do well to be angry? Because you and I know by nature in our heart of hearts, when we think of our enemy and we think of those that have wronged us, we want vengeance. We want God's condemnation to rain down. And God says to us this morning, do you do well to be angry? Is that really the response in light of a world that is lost and that is broken. If we're honest with ourselves, God's compassion by nature makes us angry. But the second thing we learn in this passage is not only does God's compassion by nature make us angry, God's compassion here actually points us to a greater Jonah. Skip ahead to verses 10 and 11. In verses 10 and 11, God is calling Jonah out and says, you're worried about a plant. I'm worried about people who are lost and dying. And I have pity on them. The word pity there is synonymous with compassion. It literally means in the Hebrew, for your heart to break, to break to the point of, to the point of mourning and weeping. And God is saying, Jonah, where is your heart? Why is your heart not breaking? Why are you not weeping? God is saying, my heart breaks in pity and compassion for people that don't know their right hand from their left hand. The phrase right hand and left hand was an ancient phrase meaning people who are helpless. And God says, I look down to people who are helpless and I have pity, my heart breaks, and it moves me to weep. Now understand, this was unheard of up until this point. A God, a deity whose heart breaks, a deity who has pity and compassion. It is what separates our worldview from every other worldview in the world. To have a God that has compassion on the finite, the infinite God of the heavens and the earth who created the heavens and the earth would actually condescend and have pity on finite creatures like you and me. Jonah had never heard it and the world had never heard it up to that point and the world has continued to never see it other than the God of the Old and New Testaments, a God whose heart breaks but causes, but causes his people to break as well. And it's here once again 
that Jonah blows it a second time, that he fails to answer the call of God now a second time. Yes, he went to Nineveh, but he is sitting there burning in anger. And this great prophet that we read about Jonah, when experiencing and witnessing the compassion of God, it is in his failure to embrace compassion that it actually points us to another prophet. You see, it is the life and the failures of Jonah over and over again that point you and me to another prophet. See, Jonah's life requires a prophet that will actually come and show compassion and show pity upon lost and broken people. You know, each week, there is one simple goal in this sermon series. It is to point us to that one story, that one story that God is weaving from Genesis to Revelation of God sending his son, Jesus Christ, to be the fulfillment of all things promised. And I know there's some Sundays where it seems like a stretch to connect the dots between what God is talking about in the Old Testament and the fulfillment of Christ in the New Testament. But this is a slam dunk. Matthew chapter 12 Verses 39 and 41. Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 12, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of a huge fish three days and three nights, so the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Slam dunk. Right there, Jesus is making the connection between himself and the prophet Jonah. Verse 41, the men of Nineveh in Jonah chapter 3 will stand up, that we read about in Jonah chapter 3, will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. But now, something greater than Jonah is here. You see, Jesus does for us this beautiful exercise of connecting the dots between the prophet who fails in Jonah chapter 4, but the prophet who would come to be the greater Jonah on our behalf. You see, Jonah preached a message of justice and wrath, but it would be Jesus, the greater Jonah, who would take the justice and wrath of God on our behalf. It would be Jonah who preached condemnation, but it would be Jesus, the greater Jonah, who would take that condemnation that we deserve, that we deserve. This is the good news of the greater Jonah and it is the compassion witnessed in Jonah chapter three and Jonah chapter four that points us to our need for this greater Jonah. So God's compassion makes us angry. God's compassion points us to a greater Jonah. And lastly, God's compassion breaks us. It eventually breaks Jonah. Notice at the very end, the most unusual of all conclusions, not only for a Bible story, but for any story, it ends with a question. Who ends a story like Jonah with a question? Who ends a story with a question mark? But you see, it's brilliant. You see, when God asks the question to Jonah, should I not pity 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left hand, Jonah is basically saying by not answering the question, it is a question so obvious it doesn't even warrant an answer. Of course. It's Jonah's way of saying, do I really need to answer this question? It is so blatantly obvious, and the question is asked to you this morning, and it shouldn't even need a response. Should you not pity Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, hundreds of thousands of people who do not know their right hand from their left hand? It doesn't even warrant a response. But the ending of Jonah is even more brilliant because unlike most good stories that tell us this happily ever ending story and ending, they lived happily ever after, most stories that end probably by telling us that Jonah finally 
recants, that Jonah finally comes around and he becomes this great global missionary. We don't read that here in Jonah. And that's the point. Because I believe that it's at this moment that Jonah finally is broken by the compassion of God. You say, how do you know that? Because no man would actually write these four chapters about how he blatantly blew it over and over again and not dress it up there at the end and tell the world how he eventually came around unless that man finally got the compassion of God and was so free to admit of what an epic failure he was over and over again, unless he himself was so secure and so free in the compassion of God. You see the ending of Jonah is brilliant because it's here we see a Jonah that is so broken by the compassion of God. He says, I no longer have to write about myself, but the ending points us to that greater Jonah. Finally, at the end of chapter four, Jonah decreases and God increases. And as I said, only a man who understands his brokenness, but at the same time embraces his savior. Only a man who understands his brokenness and embraces a greater Jonah could actually write this story so free and so secure and says, enough of me. Let me point you to the one who will come to be the one greater than Jonah. The compassion of God, it breaks Jonah and it'll eventually break you. But we can't extend this compassion to our world and we can't extend this compassion to others unless first we have experienced this compassion. And so I wanna ask you this morning, have you received it? Have you received it in a real transforming way that you can say, yes, I am living proof, a living picture of one that has been broken and has surrendered the compassion of God through the person of Jesus Christ. Maybe you thought your entire life that the message of Christianity was all about condemnation. No, that was the message of Jonah. In fact, Jesus says, I have not come to condemn the world, but that through me, the world might be saved. That, brothers and sisters, is the message of God's compassion for ourselves and for a world that is broken and lost. And if you have not experienced the compassion of God yourself, I pray that you would be broken this morning and that you would receive it freely by his grace and forever be changed. C.E. Matthews was the great evangelist of the 20th century, one of the great evangelists of the 20th, 20th century. He traveled all across America preaching in what became known as the great big tent revivals. And C.E. Matthews one evening made a stop in Austin, Texas. And at the end of the revival, the local pastor brought a, a young man in his congregation that had really been wrestling with embracing Jesus and, and surrendering his life to Christ. He was a young man that was wrestling to embrace the compassion of God. And so C.E. Matthew sat with him for about an hour, walking him through the gospel presentation, telling him about the compassion of the cross. And at the very end of the presentation, the young man said, no, I still don't buy it. I still don't get it. And with that, the evangelist C.E. Matthews broke out into tears and literally began to weep over this young man. And it was in that moment that that young man surrendered his life to Christ. Listen to me. When reason fails, it might be your tears for lost souls that will eventually pre prevail. I wanna ask you a question. When was the last time you wept for someone who was lost? When was the last time that the compassion of God displayed in your life moved you to the point of tears? I gave you the one person challenge last week. 
that between now and Christmas, we would choose one person to share the love of Christ with and to sacrificially serve. But listen to me, if that one person means for you that you're going to win an argument or win a debate, you've missed it. That one person challenge means that God, by your grace and by your spirit, would you move me to the point of tears where my heart would break like your heart breaks. Because if you do not weep for the lost and for your neighbor and weep even for your enemy, you've completely missed the compassion of God. It is weeping over the lives of those that need the good news of Jesus Christ. It's weeping and weeping and showing true compassion and pity. That, that my friends, is the story of good news for our watching world. Great is thy faithfulness. God, you are never changing and your compassions, they fail not. Listen to me. If you have experienced this compassion and you know the greater Jonah, there is only one question for you this morning, and it is this simple question. Do you have pity and compassion for the hundreds of thousands of people that do not know their right hand from their left? I pray that you do not answer with mere words. Because I pray that the answer to that question this week should be so obvious that it is just demonstrated by your lives, lives full of compassion for those that do not know their right hand from their left. Amen.